when you do address inferential confusion and you resolve inferential confusion and you are no longer getting hijacked by your imagination, very often facing your triggers or refraining from compulsions aren't really so challenging or difficult. Welcome to OCD Whisperer Show. Today with me, I have Carl Robbins, who is the Director of Training and Senior Clinician at the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland. He's also on the faculty at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry. He has been treating OCD and related disorders for over 35 years. He is a mentee of Dr. Sally Winston and has attended multiple trainings through the IOCDF, ADAA, and ABCT over his long career. He has also presented at the IOCDF and ADA conferences on both consumers and professionals. But most recently, he has done individual training with Dr. Fred Ardema, co-developer of inference-based CBT for OCD. Carl is committed to promoting the dissemination of ICBT in the U.S. throughout consultation, teaching, lectures, social media, and podcasts. Welcome to the show, Carl. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So this is a lot of things that you've done, and looks like the most recent is inference-based CBT. Mm -hmm. So I think that the question I have, and some other guests have been on the show talking about ICBT generally, but I know one thing that I get folks asking me about is what is inferential confusion anyway? So perhaps we can start with that. Okay, great. Actually, I've been giving that a lot of thought. And I was thinking that to see if we can, as my brilliant colleague, Mike Hetty says, unpack or deconstruct that term, right? And there are two pieces, inferential and confusion. And obviously, the inferential piece refers to inference-based CBT. But let's put that aside for now. Let's talk about what does it mean to be uh, confused? And I was thinking of an analogy, and my wife has two nephews that are very close in age, and they're very similar in certain ways. And I always drive her crazy because I get them confused often. I will call Pete Jack and Jack Pete the Right. And what we mean by confusion in this context is when you have trouble telling two things apart and or another meaning of confusion related to that is, is that you treat two things as if they're the same thing. Right. You conflate them. So what are we talking about in the confusion of OCD? And it's this fundamental idea that there are two different kinds of mental experience. One is perception of reality on one hand, and the other is our imagination and thinking about creating images of possibilities, right? And those are two very different ways of using our minds. So what happens in OCD is that we can get lost in our imagination in some possibility, however remote, and treat it as if it's relevant or real or important. And that we tend to sort of treat it when we're immersed or absorbed in our imaginations, we treat it as if it's something that we're actually seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching in the present moment. We all have this experience, even people without OCD have the experience of being immersed in a scary story or watching a scary movie, when we're inside of that story, when we're inside of that narrative, whether it could be our narrative or somebody else's narrative, it can feel quite real. Our bodies can react as if it's actually happening, as if it's actually important, as if we're actually in danger. But in reality, there is no current danger. And so it is part of the work is to understand uh, the power of the imagination and its ability to absorb us into these stories. And then what do we then do once we notice that we're immersed? Or how do we catch ourselves sooner before we cross over into what's called the OCD bubble or this imagined narrative story? I was going to say, so if anybody's listening right now, just in terms of grasping this. So basically, we're saying that inference-based CBT essentially teaches people to understand how it is that they are treating something that they're imagining in their mind as reality and hence responding to it in real time with their compulsions. Exactly. And in a fundamental way, we're getting tricked. We're getting Our minds are getting hijacked by our imagination. And there's another sort of kind of confusion that's also related to this, which is the difference between sort of normal uncertainty, or what would be called reasonable doubt, versus obsessional doubt, 
And particularly in the U.S., we tend to use doubt and uncertainty as if they're the same, and they're actually quite different. And let me give you a simple example of how to make this uh, distinction. Let's say I walk into my office, and I, I live in the mid-Atlantic, I walk in my office in January, and my office is cold. So I have the thought, well, maybe my heat isn't working. That's what we would call reasonable doubt, because it's based on real information, real sensory information. I can tell that it's cold in the here and now, right? And that I can resolve that doubt. I can resolve that uncertainty by collecting more information, which is to see if there are any windows are open or go over and check to see if there is a warm air coming out of the heat, out of the vent. So what would obsessional doubt be? Obsessional doubt would be I walk into my office in January and the office is warm and I have the thought maybe the heat isn't working, which is basically I'm sort of imagining a possibility, but it's not based on any sensory information, anything I can see, hear, smell, taste, or touch, or even what my common sense tells me. Now, I could then sort of make up a whole story as to how it's possible for my office to be warm, but the heat still not be working. And we could talk about having a story about a fire downstairs, even though I can't smell the smoke. And to get into this. And of course, it's impossible to resolve that because once you cross over into the imagination, there are an endless number of possibilities, right? There's been a lot of discussion recently about uncertainty in our field, uh, particularly in the American OCD community. And I think that this is a critical point of this difference between normal uncertainty and obsessional doubt. And we could go into some more examples that are OCD specific. And you're throwing around words like uncertainty and doubt, right? I also am hearing like what's reasonable versus when does it become obsessional? And I know so just from reading the, the clinician's manual for ICBT, I remember reading some, that there's a distinction that they're making between doubt is like questioning information you have in front of you that is available versus mm -hmm. uncertainty is where you don't have enough information at all, or you may never even get that information to the example like, hey, I literally 100% am uncertain about when I'm going to die, and I can't get that information. Right. And then I know we talk about some nice concepts of like functional certainties. We can start to get muddled up, I think, sometimes in words yeah, and yeah. language. And so I just yeah. wanted to yeah. ask, what's your thoughts yeah. on that? Let's give a spe specific example in the realm of OCD. Right. Let's take, for example, what often happens with checking compulsion, right? which is that, like whether it's locking the door or turning my stove on. So I turn the lock, I hear it click, I can feel it click. I know that there's nothing wrong with my, I have no information in the here and now that my door isn't locked. What would then be obsessional doubt? It would be ignoring or disregarding that sensory information of what I know to be true by trusting my senses and my common sense and imagining that somehow, and there's often a narrative involved in this, that somehow it's possible that despite of all this information I have in the here and now, it still is possible that my door is not locked and then all of the consequences that ensue from that, right? This sequence begins by this doubting process that makes me question my senses and my common sense. And that's really different. It's really different. And then, for example, I go to the doctor and the doctor sees a lump on my back and he takes a biopsy. He says, we, well, we need to check that out, take a biopsy and make sure that it's not anything significant. That would be sort of normal doubt normal uncertainty, which is that I need to wait for the information in order to sort of figure out whether that's something serious. Now, in that particular case, I can overreact to that. I can have an exaggerated response to that threat and engage in what look like compulsions, which would be to spend 80 hours on the internet Googling about lumps on the back, right? But I wouldn't call that an OCD. And this might be sort of the distinction between what we think about as being worry and generalized anxiety disorder versus OCD. Now, here's where OCD might take over in that scenario, which is that I wait for my biopsy. I might be a certain amount of nervous because of the uncertainty about whether or not it's malignant. So I call the office 10 days later and I find out that, in fact, a biopsy came back. It's fine. But then I have the doubt, oh, maybe. Maybe they mixed up the results in the lab, or maybe the secretary read the wrong chart or whatever. Now I've crossed over into what would be called obsessional doubt. 
Because again, it's based 100% on my imagination. One of the modules, one of the 12 modules in ICBT is that OCD is always 100% in the imagination, disconnected from relevant information in the here and now. And what's important is, and then this now gets into the inferential piece, this kind of reasoning error, all right, is very selective, right? Those of us with OCD don't use that kind of reasoning in other aspects of our life, right? With remote possibilities, we don't get sort of caught up in a reasoning process and a story that we tell ourselves, except only in these particular areas. So there's always a sort of a selective quality for most people with inferential confusion. And we can sort of understand, there are ways of sort of understanding what makes the inferential confusion selective for some people and not for others. I'm just thinking of anybody listening right now is there's folks have been learning more about therapy and ICBT and of course acceptance commitment therapy and all the other little acronyms we have in our field. I think one of the questions I certainly hear is the question of, When you're trying to figure out, okay, so do I do exposure response prevention or do I do ICBT? What is something somebody can think through? Because some people really love ERP and it works great for them. And some people, as they're learning more about ICBT, are really interested in enjoying ICBT. So if somebody's newer and trying to figure out what approach to do, this is a kind of question I definitely get a lot. So I'm just wondering, what would you tell folks. First, I want to acknowledge that the question itself, what do I do? Do I do ICBT, which is primarily a cognitive approach that doesn't involve exposure, or do I do ERP where the core of it involves exposure? But this whole idea that you have a choice, that there are actually are evidence-based options, right, is that in and of itself is a controversial idea, at least in the U.S., that For a long time, we've been told that if it doesn't involve exposure, that if it's not ERP, then you are not getting the proper treatment. And this gets into the whole controversy about the notion of gold standard itself. But I will tell you that this seems to be a uniquely American idea because in Canada, in Europe, and elsewhere, cognitive approaches to OCD are seen as first line interventions. And this isn't to say that ERP doesn't work or that it's inferior or that it's bad or that it's wrong. It's just that these are two very different ways of approaching OCD. And they're based on two very different models. It doesn't mean that one is wrong and the other's right. It does mean that they are different. And there's a tendency to sort of want to say, we're really using different words for the same thing. And we're not. These are radically or profoundly different ideas including this, and I'm going to come back to answering your question about choice, which is that obsessions themselves in the inference-based model aren't seen as sort of random intrusive thoughts that we misinterpret or overreact to or develop compulsions about, but that actually there's an entire, it's not just a thought, is that there's an entire story, an entire narrative that goes on that leads to engaging in compulsions or avoidance. And a big part of what's happening in inference-based work is that you're slowing your thinking down and plotting out and recognizing how your mind goes through these predictable set of steps where you're not just having random thoughts, but you're actually telling yourself a story that has very clever ways of tricking you into thinking that that story is relevant in the here and now. So how do you end up choosing? I think often people will say, ERP has been around longer than ICBT. There certainly is more data to support it. And so people would say, try that first. And if it doesn't work, or you don't, or very often people will get a response, but they won't go into remission. So one possibility is to do ICBT for a residual symptoms that aren't resolved through ERP. Although a lot of people do ERP will say, well, you just haven't done the right ERP, you got to do more ERP or whatever. So that's one possibility. Another possibility, obviously, is that there are a considerable number of people who just won't do exposure, right? They're too frightened. It feels too risky to them. So that might be a good person who's a good candidate, perhaps, to even start with ICP. And it also may be just to talk to people that understand what these different models and approaches are and sort of see what sort of matches for you. 
right? To see, particularly if you were drawn to self reflection and really sort of understanding deeply how your mind is working. And if this idea about how your mind gets tricked, that that's appealing to you, that certainly is sort of worth investigating. And a lot of people find that just makes more sense to them. It resonates with them. And one more point I'll make. When you do address inferential confusion and you resolve inferential confusion and you are no longer getting hijacked by your imagination, very often facing your triggers or refraining from compulsions aren't really so challenging or difficult. Is that when you are able to dismiss the narrative, the story, then this stuff tends not to scare you or scare you very much. So in some ways, facing your triggers is a lot less painful. It's a lot easier once you've done this cognitive work. And there certainly are a lot of people who find that to be true. Yeah, I would venture like what you just said that somebody listening might say, isn't that then doing some exposure when you're going and re-engaging with things that are triggering and difficult? Yes, and I know that's often with you. Isn't that ultimately exposure? If facing stuff that used to be hard for you, yeah, you could call that exposure. The goal here is really different than sort of tolerating distress or leaning into your core fear, or tolerating uncertainty. What the practice is, from an ICBT perspective, is to engage normally with stuff that has typically scared you, and stay connected to reality, stay connected to your senses and your common sense. What the practice is, is rather than distress tolerance or habituation is to say, I'm going to stay out of the imagined OCD bubble while I leave my house or drive the car down the road where I used to get hit and run OCD, where I'm going to play with my child. And what the work is, is to stay grounded in reality. It's there's something that we call sort of reality sensing, which is sort of an effortless, a relatively effortless process of staying in your senses and common sense. Yeah, there's so much awesome thing that you just said, but also I, I do like to keep my episodes short and sweet. For today, I, I think this was wonderful just in terms of having people hear a little bit more about what is inferential confusion. And I appreciate that, right? Distinction of ultimately find out what is ERP or ERP an act or act even on its own or ICBT, how they will approach OCD so that you could see for yourself what you seem to resonate with or, or what is it that is in alignment with you. Yeah. And what's so important is to understand that nobody's wrong. These are models. These are theories that are applied to our understanding of OCD and how to treat it. But it doesn't mean in head-to-head -head studies, but comparing ICBT and ERP, there's neither one is inferior. There are other cognitive approaches that have been shown to, to go head to head with ERP. There's metacognitive therapy that goes, and in these studies where they go head to head is, is that the answer is, is that they're both effective. And maybe the most important message that I want people to come, take out of this is that we have choices. We have evidence-based choices, right? And that if something doesn't work for you or doesn't work well enough for you, it doesn't resonate for you, it doesn't mean you have to come back when you're ready or do it anyway or just get more courageous or whatever it is, is that there actually are choices. That's wonderful news. That's awesome. news for hope. Yeah. Right? So for anybody who is listening to you today and they would like to find you, how can they find you? Probably the easiest way is just my name. Carl Robbins at anxietyandstress.com. That's the ASDI website, anxietyandstress.com. But also, if people want to learn more about ICBT, there's a fabulous website, a fabulous community. And this is both for clinicians and sufferers, as well as those of us that are both. There's a great, generous website with all kinds of resources, which is icbt.online icbt.online. And we also have a Facebook group for professionals for those of you who might want to join us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Okay. Thanks for having me.